You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. Again, excited, but 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 there's there's like I said a, a certain <clears throat> a certain heaviness, n- n- not not from a burden standpoint, um, not heaviness of spirit, but just 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 understanding the weight of of what we're we're talking about and so we we've been we've been moving through some very practical questions around spiritual warfare we talked about reclaiming lost ground right and then we and we talked about in terms of reclaiming lost ground that we need to be able to perform some spiritual cpr amen confession petition recommitment we focused our uh, attention on psalms chapter 51 and looked at david and and how his response uh to sin was after he had committed to sin with bathsheba and so we we, we talked about that <clears throat> and then we, we we looked at how do i tear down strongholds that are in my life and it really talking about check yourself before you wreck yourself and and, and 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 the line right after that is it just keeps coming back to me because it's like because living in sin is bad for your health. It just is. And, and we'll see over and over that when it comes to spiritual warfare, the eradication of sin is very key for us. Again, it's something we, we, we can't. We cannot achieve victory and wallow in sin at the same time. I, I guess, I guess there's, there's just no other way to, to say that. There's, there's no other way, and I'm, I'm just hoping that, and I'm not saying just you, I'm saying me too. We, 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 just, we will find any way that we can to try to do what God wants and hold on to our mess at the same time. And then we'll keep stumbling over the same passages of Scripture where at the end of the day, like I said, he's just saying, if you obey what I reveal, it's good. And if you don't, you needlessly complicate your life. Life is going to be hard enough if you do what I want you to do. He says anyone that's going to live righteous, anyone that's that, yea, the godly will suffer persecution. I mean, we need to clean up our lives to the point that we that what happens to us that 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 feels uncomfortable or is is tough we know that it, it's a test it's not it's not based upon our raggediness it's not based upon how we've lived our life we want to know that what we're doing is we're right in the center of the will of God and then what comes then this trouble that comes that trouble is a test and that trouble is is coming to you know the test is coming uh to make sure that 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 it's it's a building block it, it's temptation comes as a stumbling block or or those some of those challenges those things that come from the enemy are a stumbling block but if it comes from our savior it's, it's a building block we want to be in a a place where we've eliminated a lot of the guesswork out of why our lives are challenged the way they are I just want to be right in the center of the will of God and then if stuff happens it's because we're living a victorious life it's because we've got the attention of the enemy the enemy always pays attention to effective ministry amen that's a great reason to be persecuted and and, and God uh, uh, the Apostle Peter I believe he says it is like you, you want to you 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 want to be punished or you want to have challenge for doing well it's not because you you are knucklehead and, and and you didn't do what you were supposed to let let's emphasize the things of God that we need to emphasize and, and, and therefore that means that we have to eradicate sin it keeps coming back to that I just looked at it and I was looking at my notes and I I realize that at every turn that the, the steps for freedom in Christ the steps for a victorious life all have to do with the eradication of sin which means that you have got to get off the throne of your life and he has to be on it and when we do our own thing it always gets and this is a theological term jacked up You can look that you can look that up. That's right there in all of the best theological books. Yeah, your life is jacked up because of sin. 
Amen. My life, needlessly complicated. Every time I want to do what I want to do. And God is like, you do know we have a relationship, right? You do know about Hebrews 12, right? God chastises those whom he loves and scourges everyone that he receives as a son. You do know that you may get by, but you're not going to get away. You, you do realize that. And if you can live any old kind of life and not have the conviction of the Holy Spirit or not be concerned that God is going to chase you down as you run away because that's what the shepherd does. If none of that has ever happened in your life, then you better question whether you're in the fellowship at all because God is like, I am going to chase after those that I love. I am going to bring them into a place of remembrance in terms of their sin. I am going to move because they have my Holy Spirit in, in them that, 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 that there, should be a, there should be a conviction around some things. Amen. But we can get to a place uh, with our sin and our selfishness that, that, that we begin to not listen to God as we should and not appreciate uh, what he's saying to us. And that's why James says in chapter one, a double minded man is what? Unstable in all his ways. It's back to those partitions in the mind. And I was thinking about a particular partition that we have up right now in a good way for a good purpose. But but it does illustrate the point. Well, when we leave out of here, just give you just just a glimpse you know that we've had water came in the building. It's been two and a half weeks. All of that stuff on a lower level. All that stuff's been pulled up and, and all of those kind of things. But we had a, a session or a time here where we had to clean all of that. All that we could salvage, we, we, we did that over a couple of days. And we put it all upstairs on the stage. And we knew that Soul Food Sunday was coming. And it's like there's no way that we can just have all of this stuff strewn out all over the fellowship hall where it was initially. We have got to be able to have two activities go on at the same time. We got to deal with the mess, but, but we want to have the fellowship hall presentable so that when people come in, they, that, they, that, that they feel like it's still okay in terms of their church. And so when you go into the fellowship hall today, that's what you'll see. It looks great. It looks like it's always look. But if you got a chance to see behind that partition, you say, what, 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 what happened with the water? But you don't, in a good way, you, you, you don't appreciate that because we've hidden that from you. But that's how, that's how you and I do in our lives. There's, there's all of this mess that we hide, and then it allows us to have these real nice you know, events and, and nice things happening in our lives. And, and literally, if you, if you don't look behind that curtain, if we don't go back and if we don't remember what's there to deal with it, we could literally move on like nothing happened and not realize there is a whole mess that we still have to deal with. As Sister Kim was saying, like, we got some real cleansing to do and some purging to do back there. We can't keep all of that stuff. We just moved it for now and we set up a partition, a partition and said, we'll deal with it later. And you and I do that all the time. With so many activities and so many situations, so many people, so many experiences, we say, you know what? I'm just going to put this up here, put that partition up, and eventually what may happen is you just don't deal with it at all. And you know who likes that more than anybody? The enemy. Because he works on the other side of that partition building strongholds with the stuff that you and I don't deal with. And that's why James said, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. He's saying, get back there behind that curtain and on that stage and deal with that stuff because nothing in this church, in this situation, will be right until you do. It's not going to be right till we deal with it. 
It's not going to be right until we get the resources that we're supposed to get in place. And so many things have happened, but there's a process to recovery, amen, for our church. But there's a process of recovery in your life. There's been an event. There's been a flood. Your boiler room is underwater. You pump the water out. That's the first step. Great. But you do realize there's no carpet down there. There are no seats. We can't use the nursery. There are no desks in the classroom. We ripped everything out of there. Amen? And if we're going to get back to a place where we're able to fully utilize, come on, somebody, this building, and if you're going to be able to fully utilize the vessel that God has given you, you've got to be able to deal with that. And that means there's hard work and there's conversations, and you got to follow up with people, and you got to do things, and you gotta, you got to deal with contractors, and you you got to get folks in to do the work. And it's not going to be easy. The event happened, but you can't solve it overnight. You got to work at it. You got to pay attention to it. Otherwise, it'll sit and it'll fester and you'll just hide everything up behind the stage and just say, we're going to move on. But you know and I know that if you go down in that lower level, here's that theological term again, it's jacked up. But if I put a barrier so that you don't go downstairs and we hide everything behind the stage, it'll just feel you can go in and out of here week after week and it'll just fade from your memory. That's being double minded from a spiritual standpoint. And that's that's part again, just so you know, this is not my message, but this is my message. Because this is what God wanted me to tell you specifically today, even before we get into what we're supposed to get into. It is back to the part. That's the only thing I wrote down on the back to partitions. That's what I wrote down because I know that's what he wanted me to talk about. A double minded man is unstable in all his ways. And so we got to be able to remove partitions. And so the scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 uh, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, the casting down of imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, that's the partition, and bringing into uh, obedience everything, every thought unto the obedience in Christ, amen? And so we have the weapons to be able to tear down strongholds and bring down partitions, amen? And so if we have the weapons, it doesn't matter unless we do what? Use the weapons. And so again, I'm, I'm, it's just a little bit of review around this, but again, God has given us weapons. He's given us the, the weapons of our warfare, which is the armor of God and warfare prayer and warfare praise. And he's saying, I need you to activate all of these things. But the underlying theme or that there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a stream or a string that goes to everything that God is encouraging us around in terms of, of, of partitions and strongholds and warfare. And it's like, Dude, you have got to stop living a sin-filled life. And we are struggling constantly to find a solution to our problems that still allows us to live the way we want to live. In our flesh. I'm not saying that like the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me from the body of this death? He's saying there's a, there's a twainness in me. I want to do what God wants me to do. But doggone it, I also want to do what my spirit, my, my flesh wants me to do. And there's that, that constant struggle, that give and take. And sometimes our flesh wins. And, 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 and hopefully more times as we mature in Christ, our our spirit is victorious where we can have a fleshly thought and we can say, no, nah, I'm not doing that. Nope, I'm not pursuing that. Nope, I'm not following up on that. Nope, I'm going to go a different way. No, I'm going to remember the disappointment I have when the Holy Spirit convicts me and I just don't want to go through that. And I don't want to put God through that. I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit by what I do. And the more we say and do that, the, the better off we are in terms of the victory that we'll see in our life over our personal sin. Amen? And what, what we, I think, fail to appreciate is the fact that what you do affects others. What I do affects others. There, there is a 
almost, I would say, a, a horizontal effect, meaning uh, we're all linked together in the body of Christ, and we don't want to be that weak, weak link. Amen? That our, that our adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, uh, roameth about seeking whom he may devour. It, it's it's kind of like he's going all along and saying, where, where, where is there a weakness at, at, at New Life Christian Fellowship? They're all linked together, arm in arm. Who, who, who's who, who's kind of weak? That's why I'm going to attack. <coughs> Amen? And we don't want to be that weak link. But what we fail to appreciate, too, is there is a, there's a generational kind of uh, effect that goes on with what, with what we do. And, and it, it, it's, you, you see it right in the middle of, of, of God giving the, the, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. And, and, he, and he says, you shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them for I'm the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. He repeats the same concept in, 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 in Exodus chapter 34 and 7 and also in Jeremiah 32 and 18. Again, this, this, this understanding that sin can have an effect to the third and what? Fourth generation. But I love the fact he said, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so again, I love the fact that, that God is like, and, and in terms of scale, if you're obedient, it has many more benefits, amen, to, the, to a thousand generations if you do what I say. You can pass that on too, and you can teach your children that, and you can walk that before them, and you can be a living embodiment of, of, of faithfulness to them. And so most things aren't, aren't caught there, uh, are taught, they're caught. And he says, if you live that kind of life in front of your kids, that, that can perpetuate a godly legacy but if you live a life of uh, of sinfulness that will perpetuate some things as well amen and so there's this there's this concept that you see there when when God said I, I'm, I'm concerned the first thing is I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and he says you shall have no other gods before me he's concerned about the supremacy of his worship I gotta be supreme uh, supreme in terms of worship but then he says don't make for yourself any graven Im images amen it's not then the supremacy of his worship beloved it's that the accuracy of his worship he says, if, if you try to worship me and you try to form something that, that uh, is a bird or a fish or a reptile or something, trust me, you're going to get it wrong. You're going to reduce me. You're going to diminish me. So don't even try. Just worship me as I am. Amen. The accuracy of worship, he said, but, but if, you, if you're involved in it in anything, you shall not bow down to them or worship them for I'm the Lord your God. I'm a jealous God. And he says, I punish the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generations. And, and so when we're talking about spiritual oppression and we're talking about dealing with spiritual oppression, I'm telling you that the path to victory in this area incorporates all of the strategies, we, those two strategies that we talked about with recruiting claiming ground and tearing down strongholds and in the tearing down strongholds as you recall it was James chapter 4 when we talked about being able to release and to be able to repent and to be able to reclaim and and to excuse me uh to reject the world and then to be able to repent but the most important thing was to be able to do what rely on God's what greater grace the grace that never runs out, the grace that's always available, the, the, the grace that, that God gives, not again, not salvation grace, but sanctifying grace and sustaining grace and surrounding grace and superior grace and supporting grace. And so all of that is, is in the background of that. But there is the distinctive here when we're talking about dealing with spiritual oppression <clears throat> is that there are evil spirits present that must be removed. Amen. And we don't like to talk about spirits. It's like you can go one of two things, and, and this is typically what happens. You, you can follow on one side of it where it's like you ignore that there is any kind of spirits that are doing any kind of work or damage or moving in the world, and that obviously denies scripture. Or <clears throat> you see a spirit in everything. 
The devil is making you do this. Demons are making you do that. You see this. You see that. And so you go all the way over where you over, you over spiritualize everything. And then you see a demon behind every bush and every tree. And this spirit did this. I see the spirit. The spirit of laziness is, oh, no, maybe not. You just might be lazy. May not necessarily be a spirit of laziness, but, but you could probably just be lazy. It might be this or that. But again, that's why discernment is so important. It's so powerful. And again, you can't, you won't get a manual when it comes to spiritual warfare that says, in this exact situation, I can assure you that it is a spirit. And in this situation, it's not a spirit. You have to do what? Have some discernment, which means that you have to maintain a good connection with the shepherd who has all of the resources that allow you to be able to discern. That's why we talked about, can you hear me now? You got to be in a place where you're close to the shepherd. You got to stay in the, in the coverage zone and you, 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 you don't need to have, you don't need to be roaming. You need to stay close to the shepherd so that you know what's going on. There was a situation that we had at Circle Y many years ago, and it was one of the funniest things that we had been involved in. Many of us were there. There was a young lady that was there and she was, she was troubled and she was dealing with some things and, and, and she began to have some manifestations, if you will, that led us to believe that there might be a demon present. We did. No, I'm serious. I mean, she, yeah, amen. She, she has some manifestations. Yeah, she was in Kim's cabin, which I don't know what the connection is. You, you socialize that among yourselves. But she, he was in Kim's cabin. Kim was her leader. She was in Kim's cabin. And so she, again, in Kim's cabin. So she came down to the infirmary area and that we got some panic call in the middle of the night and pastor dwight was up he was the camp pastor i was there I'm pretty sure pastor mark was there too and so they come down in a big rush it's like this young lady is she was doing stuff eyes rolling doing whatever it was just you know some kind of stuff and so we get out of bed we we, we roll over there and, du and, and and dwight looks at her he has his bible we all out of breath Dwight makes an assessment in, I don't know, it, it seemed like seconds. He looked at her. He said, that girl don't more have a demon than the man in the moon. Good night, I'm going to bed. He closed his Bible and he left. And we were all there, you know, all ready for warfare. We ready to pray, do whatever. But taking his lead, he knew, and it turned out no. She was acting out. She was trying to get attention. There were some other things that were happening. But to be able to have discernment, to be able to know that, we were ready. We were prepared. It's like, this is it. We're getting ready to go in. It's going to be a long night. Somebody put a pot of coffee on. The wife showed up and said, listen, that girl don't more have a demon than the man in the moon. Good night. I'm going to bed. Good luck with that. And he rolled out, and I was like, And so we left, and it turned out that that was right. But, but in a different situation, those same manifestations, we've been at camp where we've had other situations where there was a demon present. So, again, you need discernment. You need wisdom. And so we're talking about spiritual oppression. Amen? And, again, there are three things when we talk about the, the demonic. It's demonic aggression. Amen. Which every believer should experience at some point. That's just because you've got the uniform on. You're a soldier. You're in the army. Satan has cohorts, the forces of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. All of those kind of uh, uh, th those all of those kind of beings that are engaged in this world to frustrate and, and, and to destroy what God is building in your life and around you. Amen. So demonic aggression. We should expect that, especially if we have effective ministry. Then there's demonic oppression which is a more intensified uh, version of uh, of demonic aggression that's more targeted to you and oftentimes happens because you and I have opened ourselves up to something sin based amen there's unclaimed territory there are strongholds that have been built and there's some some things that we've ignored in our life there's some some past hurts that we haven't dealt with there's anger there's bitterness there might have been rape or incest or other things that have happened that that have been traumatic there might be idolatry witchcraft there's all these other kind of things that could be in our experiences that we've opened ourselves up to that are sin based and there is demonic oppression that comes along with that and then finally there's demonic what possession amen which 
as we believe that scripture teaches is not for believers because when you talk about possession you're talking about ownership and we know that Jesus Christ bought us we know ye not that you were bought with a price so therefore honor your uh your, honor your God in your body which is the Lord so again possession has everything to do with ownership and since God owns us by definition we can't be possessed but but you can be you can be harassed you can be uh uh um uh, frustrated by and, and and actually whether that happens from this distance from here from there whatever it's real and, and and many believers have have had to deal with things and again a lot of it has to do with the fact that there are evil spirits that are present that have to be removed and like I said I don't care if 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 you want to make a distinction between it sits on your shoulder or inside outside close that doesn't matter but there's not a possession issue but then again that doesn't mean that you can't have a demon in your car that 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 and that example that we've had before that that hitchhiker turns into a hijacker amen hijacks your whole program hijacks the program of God takes you to places that you don't want to go and we talked about all of that so again I'm bringing all of that back up to remember for you to be able to remember that the most pervasive form of oppression is sin based that's why your obedience and my obedience how we respond to God is so crucial and that's why that's why I feel this 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 weight of responsibility because there's no other way to say it other than the fact that we have to be obedient. And that's why I keep saying we needlessly complicate our lives because we just won't do what God has revealed. We will try to find any other avenue other than giving up who we are and what we want. And you'll read a scripture Beloved, like Exodus chapter 20, when he says, I don't want any idols before me. Don't make any graven images. And you're like, yeah, that's interesting. But today, that we, don't, we don't do that. We don't have idols. Really? Really? You don't, you don't have an idol. An idol is anything that you put above your relationship with God or that affects the supremacy or accuracy of your worship to God, that becomes an idol. Anything that you're focused on that robs God of his glory is an idol. And so many of us are bowing down at the, the idol of American immediate gratification and we're, we're bowing down at the idol of power and, and prestige and provision. And, 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 and let me give you a news flash: The biggest idol in your life is you the biggest idol in your life and let me give you another news flash it's not only like the biggest idol in your life is you it's always been you amen it's not like oh this is now this is a new thing I just haven't heard about this no anything that you put above your relationship with God and, and so so let me let me just let, let me just help you with this in Deuteronomy chapter eight. And you 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 remember this w when he said he says, when you come into the land, he says, I, I want you to remember the Lord, your God and, and the good land that he's given you. And he says, but he says, when thou hast eaten and art full when thou, and thou shalt bless the Lord God, he says, but beware that you forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments. There's God dog. We're back to that again. The whole obedience thing? Really? Yeah. It keeps coming up. Obey his commandments and his statutes, his judgments, which I commanded thee, lest when you have eaten and are full, and when you herd and your flocks multiply, and your heart will be lifted up, and thou will forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of Egypt. And then you'll say something like this, and thou shalt say in thy heart, verse 17, my power. <clears throat> My power and the might of my hand hath gotten me this wealth. I get a shiver every time I, 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 I hear that. But thou shalt remember the Lord, and it shall be if thou, do, if thou do it all, forget the work of thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them. I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. He said, be careful, because when you get to a place where you are satisfied and I actually 
give you what I promised to give you, you very easily can transfer your trust from pro provider to provision. You can very well and easily forget me. You'll stop being obedient to what I've revealed because your situation has changed. And then you will begin to think it has something to do with you. And then you will do these three things. You will disregard God. You will deny God. You will defraud God and you'll destroy yourself. That's what Deuteronomy 8 teaches us. And the defrauding of God is if you say you've done something that God has done, that literally is the, you're defrauding him of his glory. And Isaiah says, I am the Lord, your God. That is my name and my glory. I will not share with another. Idol worship at its core is about appropriating God's glory and what's due him to something else. And in this case, somebody else. You and I are the biggest idols in our lives. And anything else that we put above our, uh, uh, the revelation of God, anything else we put above giving God his due and his glory, we, pit, we get in a place where it's a slippery slope. We disregard God, amen, we deny God, then we defraud God, and ultimately God said, you'll destroy yourself. And, and, and so again, the most pervasive form of oppression is, is, is sin-based. It's sin-based. And I'm just going to pivot to this, and then we're going to close. And I'll get to the rest of this later. I, I want to share this. I want to share this with you. We talked about, in James chapter 4, we talked about this. He says, know ye not that what? Friendship with the world is what? It's enmity. It's, 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 it's at complete complete odds with God. It's complete. It's like you, almost like you can hear God say, you, you got to be kidding me. You're, you adulterous people. He considers it adultery because that means you're in a committed relationship and you're cheating on God. I'm cheating on God when we follow after what the world would have us to do. He says, you keep, you keep running after the, the, these things that the, that the world has revealed to be important. And again, that, 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 that could fall into the category of, of idol worship. We're, 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 we're lifting ourselves up. We're lifting up what the world would have us to believe in. We're worshiping at these, at these altars, particularly in America, of, 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 of prestige and power and provision. Not that the pursuit of those in and of themselves become the problem but it's like if it's not in proportion if it's not in the in the right perspective in terms of what God provides you can easily do those three things you can disregard God deny God and then defraud God and if you do those three things you will destroy yourself and guess who's guess who's oh so willing to help you do that and so again that's why this sin based sin based oppression and, 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 and opening ourselves up from a sinful standpoint you 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 we, we've got literal forces of darkness that are just they're waiting for us to do that i'm waiting for you to put up a partition i'm waiting for you to ignore that hurt i'm waiting for all and then i can start to build and i can just do what i do that's what they, they live for that destroying lives and they're good at it and it's like, oh, we got this on lock. We can do this and we can do this. And they're not paying attention. They're not keeping short accounts with God. They're, they're, they're not, they're, they're, there's, nothing, there's nothing that they're doing that uh, 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 is allowing them to, to, to understand that the pervasiveness of sin. And, and they're not humble and they're, and they're not understanding and they're not keeping short accounts. They run wild when there's no short accounts. Amen? And it's like, the, the sin is sin based oppression is 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 going to be a big challenge again as, as I say when it comes to spiritual warfare but it's a big challenge in every aspect of our life if we don't do what God says our lives get in a theological term again jacked up he says, you adulterous people, don't you know friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he causes us to, to live in us envies intensely? And so let me just give you this. Another scripture, another perspective. Again, different voice. Now it's James. 
I mean, it was James. It was James there. Now it's going to be the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to give you this, and I, I and, and we'll just hopefully this will this will help solidify what what I'm trying to say about uh, about sin and sin based oppression. Even before we get into the fact that it can be pre conversion, it can be post conversion or generational, and that that's really the meat of this. There's pre conversion sin. There's there's post conversion because we continue to have struggles. But there is another element of it. There's some things that happen that 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 are generational. And again, thinking about Exodus chapter 20, and then looking at examples with with David and his sons. Thinking about Eli and his sons, where the sin of the father literally is visited on the sons, and there are things that are happening in in, in the children's lives that almost like they don't have it doesn't have anything to do with them they didn't do anything amen but but something has happened as i say upline that needs to get dealt with and if you don't deal with it you could be frustrated your progress in christ could be compromised you could find yourself uh dealing with and just not not understanding why you can't make the progress that you want to make because it can very well have something to do with something generational with the familial spirit familial meaning in your family amen unconfessed sin particularly with idolatry and witchcraft there's some things that are that are happening but but overall just 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 take away from today this issue this challenge it is in second corinthians chapter six and it says this be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness and what concord, what agreement, if you will, hath Christ with Belial, Belial being another name for the devil, Christ with the devil, or what part hath the believer with an infidel? An infidel? And what agreement, verse 16, hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, do what? Come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Verse 18, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Here's three things I want you to know out of that passage. The problem is friendship. Amen? That's the problem. The problem is friendship with the world. The problem is friendship. He says, don't be unequally yoked. What communion, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? There's a friendship problem that we have. Amen? And we need to understand that with the world, it's not the same fellowship. It's not the same partnership. It's not the same kinship. It's not the same worship. Amen? They're pursuing different things than the things of God. And it's not the same fellowship. It's not the same kinship. It's not the same partnership. It's not the same worship. And if you and I are friends with the world, truly friends, if we're tight with the world, that's a problem. The problem is friendship, the wrong kind of friendship. Now see that the promise that God makes to us is relationship. Amen. He says, I will do what? Dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God. They will be my people. He says, I I'm promising you a relationship. The relationship is with the father. I'll give you my presence. I'll give you my protection. So that's that's awesome. God promises relationship to to, to the to the problem of friendship. He, he promises relationship and the literal prescription for the problem that we have is in that last verse, which is lordship. Amen? The problem is what? Friendship. Amen? The promise is relationship and then the prescription that that scripture gives us for how to solve that friendship problem is lordship. And I will be a father unto you and shall be, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith who? The Lord Almighty. Make me Lord and we will solve this friendship with the world problem. There is no way around it. God is telling us the same thing over and over and over. Different parts in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. Paul, James, whoever else, Timothy, Peter. He's saying the same thing over and over and over. We're too attached to the world. We need to give up on what we want to do. And we need to allow God to be more than just Savior. He has to be Lord. And if there's a lordship solution, that means that you and I are not on the throne of our lives anymore. We're not doing what we want to do. We're off of our agenda and on the his. That's the definition of being obedient. 
Selfishness is killing us. Sin is killing us, us doing what we want to do, and we have no idea what the stakes are. We think, okay, I just messed up. It's just me. It's not just you. It affects me. It could possibly, and more, more distinctly, could affect your children. There might be some effect from what somebody else did that's affecting you now. It all matters. One of my favorite TV shows of all time is The Wire. And there was a scene between these two cops, one who had gotten kicked off the force for something he did as he interacted inappropriately with a, actually a minister in the, in the neighborhood. He got a bad tip and he jacked him and, and, and roughed him up and he ended up losing his job. And he went back. He was talking to his best friend on the force. And they were talking. And there was a situation where his friend was now in a leadership position in the police department. And uh, there was a situation where he was going to have to tell on another officer. There was, a, there was some interaction with the public. That officer was wrong. They usually try to cover that kind of stuff up and form that blue wall. And he didn't like the attitude and he said, I got to take a stand. I, 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 I'm going to say what really happened. And it was going to cost him, you know, the relationships, the whole thing, you know, people going to be upset. And his, his buddy had left, that had left the force said, yeah, I heard what happened. What are you going to do? And he told him, he looked at him, he said, remember how you were supposed to do X or Y or Z and you didn't do it? And he looked around, he's like, yeah, so what? He said, it matters. It all matters. We didn't think it did, but it does. Everything matters. He was like, the way we police, the way we interact, the whole thing, we thought it was just some, some really big issues. He's like, like, everything we do when we're in this uniform, everything we do, and it builds upon each other, it all matters. But he said, it matters, it all matters. That, that's what I'm saying to you, it matters. It matters what you do, it matters what you don't do. It all matters. We can't just be so cavalier about our disobedience and think that they're not real stakes, that we're not exposing ourselves to, to real problems, real issues, real challenges, real, real enemy that's designed, that is, lives and breathes to kill us. It matters. It all matters. Everything you do, everything I do, every bad decision I make, it matters. It matters to my wife. It matters to my children. It matters to my grandchildren who I've not met yet. And if the Lord would see fit to give us some, that it'll matter. It matters what granddaddy did. It matters what mom did and what dad did. It matters what your sister does, your brother does. It matters what your friend does. It matters. It all matters. He said, I, I know we thought it didn't, but it does. And he connected everything together. He said, it's the whole experience. That's why I have to take a stand now, because it matters. And that's why I want you to take a stand now, because it matters. It all matters. And we're going to find out more about how it matters when we're together again. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise you.